Today's presentation will be about hammer uh, efficiency while handling a hand hammer and held by Rainier Hoving. Die heutige Präsentation wird gehalten von Rainier Hoving und es geht Effizienz bei der Handhabung des Handhammers. Uh, all of this, what I'm going to tell, might sound very basic to many of you. I still think it is wise to think about a basic thing like this once in a while, since basics make up the foundation which everything else is built upon. Well, firstly, I would like to state that what I'm about to share is mostly my opinion and my ideas how things could work. I'm in no way an expert on this matter. I only have my own experience and common sense. When forging by hand, there are many parameters in play, and I would like to take a look at some of them. Them. Weight of the hammer and length of the handle, control and balance, and speed and frequency. Weight and length. If we take a look at some basic physics, the weight of the hammer doesn't bring as much to the equation as the velocity of the hammer does. This means a light hammer on a long handle can exert the same or more energy than a heavy hammer on a shorter handle can. Well, if you see the equation about the kinetic energy, you can see that the velocity part is squared and therefore it has much more weight, if you will, to the equation more than the mass does. But then there is the control. What about it? Me, a light hammer on a long handle can feel like a loose cannon where a heavy your hammer has a more steady trajectory. The longer the handle, the more speed you can generate, but this comes at an expense. The level of control decreases as the length of the handle increases. I think um, you all understand what I mean about that. One way to make up for this control part is to put your thumb on top of the handle. I make a lot of hammers for farriers mostly, and I've seen many of them at work. Day-to-day -day shoeing and competing, and many farriers put their thumb on top of the handle. Here in Holland, farriers even learn this in school. I personally have learned that this is a very bad habit because you eventually will get issues with your arm as I was told but I never learned why exactly until now my wish was to research this subject with people who know how the human body works and visualize what happens while forging a while ago I was talking with Patrick about this matter and he saw a possibility to consult an expert. As it turns out, the thumb on top is stressful for your tendons and should be avoided. Because when we look at what happens during forging is that the hammer bounces back after hitting the anvil. And if your thumb is on top of the handle, it receives the first shock of the rebound. This shock on the tendon attachment travels through your arm all the way up to your spine and could damage all these areas over time. As you can see in the pictures, I've... Um showed how it looks if you hold your thumb on top if anybody didn't know already and the other configuration is that you hold your thumb more on the side of the hammer or totally around the handle sometime someone explained to me um, your wrist joint can move in different directions if you hold your hand in front of you with the palm facing sideways, you can bend your wrist in this manner. If you want, you can try this. The other um, option is that you hold your palm facing down and then you bend your wrist like this. And if you try this for yourself, you'll find out what works easier for you. And most people choose the second option because it's a more natural um, movement for your wrist. And if you hold your thumb on top, uh, you your wrist has to move in this direction, which is um, less natural than the other one. Then you have the balance. And to me, that's a very important important part. We also have the form of the hammer, regardless of its weight. When the mass is close to the handle, the hammer becomes more stable, more balanced, even when hitting from an angle or with a tilted hammer. To me, this balance is very important. When the mass isn't central, I have the feeling I have to catch the hammer after a blow to bring it back to the trajectory it was supposed to follow. Somewhat the same as a light hammer on a long handle feels to me. Well, that's shown in the picture as well. Both cross peen hammers are one and a quarter kilogram. The left hammer, of course, has more mass uh, located around the handle, making it a more stable hammer. And the other one is a standard traditional uh, cross peen. When you personally, when I use the, the peening side of that hammer on an angle, the face of the hammer tends to fall further and then it twists in my hand. Then I have to catch the hammer and bring it back to the course. Well, now we come to the part I actually want to talk about speed and frequency. As we learned from the physics, speed is a big factor in exerting energy, but speed isn't the same as frequency. As I've learned from teaching, st some students think that hitting fast is the way to go. Because I believe frequency is a very important part in forging, I would like to share my ideas about this subject. Every particular hammer held on a particular place on the handle by a particular smith has his own optimal frequency. I tend to look at the trajectory of a hammer blow as if it were a pendulum. When you take a weight 
and you put it on a piece of string and you fix the other end, it becomes a pendulum. This setup with a certain weight and a certain length of string has a fixed frequency when given a swing. Regardless of its amplitude, the frequency stays the same. But when you decrease the length of string, the frequency increases as shown in the videos. Here on the right side, you see a shorter piece of string and on the left side, you see a longer piece of string. The weight is the same, but as you can see, the frequency is different. The shorter string has a higher frequency. And I believe that forging with the hand hammer works the same as this. The hammer being the weight and the handle combined with your arm, the piece of string. The hammer doesn't pass a center point as the pendulum does, but it hits the anvil or preferably the workpiece on the anvil. And then because of the rebound, starts its way back up again as if it just passed the center point. When the hammer reaches the highest or the dead point of the swing, it starts its new strike again. On top of the swing, the maximum potential energy is reached and the hammer has no kinetic energy. At the moment of impact, all the built-up kinetic energy is at its max. When there is no energy added somewhere in the trajectory, this movement fades out, of, of course. That is where the smith comes into play. The smith can add energy by accelerating the hammer on the downstroke. This increases its speed and this adds energy to the blow, which gives more rebound for the way up again. In this manner, the movement is maintained. As we have seen with the pendulum, the weight and the length influence the frequency. In forging, the weight of the hammer and the combined length of the handle and arm of the smith have its own frequency. If you grab the hammer closer to the head, you shorten the total length, making it possible to increase the frequency. What I have seen is that some students can't find the optimal frequency and get tired soon. I then always give them a piece of wood to hammer on because it doesn't need to be heated up and they can keep hammering. I then ask them to try a very slow rhythm and gradually increase the speed to very fast and from there feel where the optimal frequency is because that is when the hammer doesn't seem to weigh as much and everything feels easy. I've made a video um, to show in slow motion what happens on a full swing. I've used a piece of wood for a good rebound. This uh, is the optimal frequency. And as my teacher described it, the hammer dances. I hoped to show in the video a dancing hammer. Because when the hammer dances, it costs the least energy. And therefore, I always try to use this optimal frequency when forging. Then I can relax at the anvil. And I believe that is the best way to go and keep going. If you would work above this optimal frequency, you'd have to add energy somewhere in the trajectory to counteract the inertia. This could be done at the top of the swing. Then you start pulling the hammer down before it reaches its dead point, which wouldn't be very wise because the maximum energy, the maximum potential energy is reached at this dead point. Another possibility is you start lifting the hammer before it bounces back. Then in fact, you stop the hammer before it has delivered all its ki kinetic energy to your workpiece. I agree this might sound far-fetched, but I have seen it happen on many occasions. So again, to my opinion, it is most wise to work around the optimal frequency because then you can exert the most effect with the least amount of effort. My wishes, though I hope all I've said to you sounds logical to you, it is not my ambition to tell everyone how it should be done. My wish is that by sharing my ideas on this matter, I can make you start thinking about your own way of forging and where possible, you even make it easier for yourself. Sharing thoughts is key to my opinion. The craft we practice is wonderful in many ways, but unfortunately not without consequence for ourselves if executed wrong. Some effects might not arise at once, seeming safe at the time, but once they do arise, it might be too late to change. After all, our body is the most important tool in our toolbox. Please do as you see fit, and please do what feels right to you. Uh, relax in your work, and enjoy. Wonderful. This has been a great presentation. Thank you so much. Wunderbar. Das war eine fantastische Präsentation. Vielen Dank dafür. 
So there are already like the first comments in the chat. And the first one, yes, and uh, now the first one was from Mariano. Mariano had, had dazu einen Kommentar, würde den eben gerne dazu, hat sich als erster dazu gemeldet. Genau, um, ja, Mariano, bitte sag dir doch einfach. My first year in Blacksmith, I find I make a, a mistake uh, handing the hammer. I don't know. If you turn your hand a little, you you're gonna lost your finger. It's the same problem when you use the hammer like that. But you hold uh, in the right manner, but the hand is turned a little. So how uh, you can solve this problem? The handle needs to be in the in line with your hand and not in the side. Um, most people when start blacksmith have this problem because uh, it's easy to hand and control the hammer, but the same like this. It's easy to control the hammer, but it's uh, really dangerous for your body. Do you want, want to react to this, Rainia? I, I, I try to understand it completely, but placing uh, your hand in the right manner on the handle um, is, is very important. I don't know if I understand completely, but um, for <clears throat> optimal control, it's, um, it's nice to have a digit on top of the handle. Yeah. Is that right, uh, Mariano? Yes, that... you can use... It's, it's difficult to... <laughs> no, no, uh, I, I can see it clearly. It's a little turn, and all the, all the impact or, or the heat is absorbed only in this finger because it's um, how it is in English the articulation <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, um, all the heat is absorbed here but if you turn a little all the impact is absorbed with the hand yeah. uh, with the with the arm so you don't feel the impact and you can uh, force all your life without problems. But yeah. if you turn a little, it's gonna be a problem here. Yeah. Maybe one year or two years, but it's gonna hurt a little. Yeah, and you might not notice it uh, from the beginning, yeah. but when you notice it, mostly it's too late. Yeah, yeah. we agree totally. Yeah. And some people notice after five minutes, for example, me. There has been several comments. For example, John Dittmeyer has said that uh, he thinks that Mariano's explanation is somewhat similar to that one of Udri Hofi. Paul Foss and also I have somewhat similar impression to what you say, Mark. Yeah. Uh, great. And Mark Esprey has commented that I would like to add that the shape of the face or the cross pin will influence and the trajectory and stability of the hammer swing. The downside to a crowned hammer is that it, that if filing afterwards, you have a lot of work to do. Yeah. Now, um, I, I saw the comment already and I grabbed the two hammers in the picture. Um, and I, I hope you can see it. This is the um, unstable hammer, which has a, a, a very straight uh, pin on it. And this is my stable hammer having a sort of crowned pin on it. Um, I think so too. Um, this helps a lot with the stability um, because if you hit with the uh, with the sharp corners of the of the pin of this hammer slightly tilted, then it tends to fall over and then it starts to wobble. Um, I think that is what uh, Mark means. Mariano hat uh, als erster hinzugefügt, dass der uh, im, im Prinzip das was und da waren wir uns dann im Nachhinein noch alle einig, das was Uri Hofi dazu sagt, dass äh, wie, wie man die Hand hält, dass das sehr, sehr vorteilhaft ist. Das ist die Kurzform von dem, was dazu gesagt wurde. Und äh, dann hat Mark Esprey hinzugefügt, dass ähm, die, wenn die Finne ein wenig, ein wenig konkav ist, dass das dazu führt, das hat Reini auch gerade gezeigt, genau, dass, ähm, die, dass, da, dass man dadurch stabiler damit arbeiten kann, als mit der komplett geraden Finne, wie man sie jetzt gerade links im Bild gesehen hat. John Dittmeyer has just posted the, um, like he has written, an, I assume this is what it is, um, the article he has wrote last year for the Hammers Blow, for the beginning of this year, <laughs> or last year, for the Hammers Blow about an ergonomic hammer handle. 
uh, I assume this is what this is. And uh, from own experience, I can tell that this is a pretty good technique. So, and I highly recommend you have a look at it because it's, uh, it has helped me a lot and saved my wrist already. John Dittmeier hat letztes Jahr einen Artikel für den Hammers Blow geschrieben, also äh, unter, unter anderem einen geschrieben über einen ergonomischen Hammergriff und den hat er gerade in den Chat hineingepostet. Ich kann nur empfehlen, den runterzuladen. Der hat meine, mein Handgelenk auf jeden Fall schon geschont. Ähm, ja, sehr, 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 sehr lesenswerter Artikel. Thank you, John, for this article. Also, personally, really, really great. Maybe add something about the length of the handle. I learned from Mark Asperi and Sean Williams. Uh, you can measure the length uh, using, uh, you put the handle in this side, this manner, and your your handle ends uh, here. Maybe a little shorter, a little longer, depends on uh, everybody, everyone. But is a, for me, for example, is a good length for a handle. This is a little shorter, maybe eight centimeter or something like that. But it's like you said, Rainier, it's easy to control and you can hit a, with a high frequency. And you move smoke, smoke material. This is the difference between, uh, I find, between, for example, United States and Europe. Uh, in United States, they use uh, the slash hammer, the two handle hammer, uh, and they use a long, uh, a long way, a long move to hit, but super stronger. And I find, for example, in Germany, they move uh, shorter, but faster. So you can hit more times, less harder, but uh, you move maybe more material. And you have a little more control. Of course, depends on practice, but it's a good difference between two countries or two sides. Well, I, I think I have to translate this. So. Ähm, Mariano ja. sagte, er hat von Mark Esprey, das hat er auch gerade, und noch einem Kollegen, den Namen habe ich jetzt gerade nicht. John Williams. John Williams, thank you. Ähm, dass der Hammerstiel in, als, als Richtwert von hier bis hier geht, also von, von, Hand, von der Handfläche bis zum Ellbogen geht, das steht auch in dem Artikel übrigens drin, den John Dittmeier dazu gepostet hat. Und ähm, Danach hat Mariano gesagt, dass er da auch einen Unterschied feststellt zwischen zum Beispiel den amerikanischen Kollegen und den deutschen Kollegen, wenn ein Vorschlaghammer oder Zuschlaghammer genutzt wird, dass die amerikanischen Kollegen immer ganz weit ausholen und um dadurch härter zu hauen und die ähm, zum europäischen Kollegen häufig ähm, eine kleinere Bewegung machen, dazu dadurch eine höhere Frequenz haben, also schneller zuhauen können. What's your opinion between these two techniques, the long way or the short right. way? Uh, well, personally, I, I use uh, I use both um, uh, both options, uh, but it depends on the work I have to do. Hmm. Um, when I'm um, uh, forging uh, with a, um, uh, as a striker with another blacksmith, um, and I'm striking top tools. I always try to use a, a longer swing because the frequency is quite low. Mostly they are um, sing, single blows. Uh, the Smith uh, places the top tool slightly different and then you strike again. Uh, but when you're, uh, for example, drawing out something together, uh, the Smith with a hand hammer and the striker with the, uh, with the sledge, um, I use the, 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 the shorter um, grip the more European grip, because then you can uh, have a higher a frequency together with two or even more people. And um, uh, I spoke about the, the, the frequency and the, the bounce back and um, the rebound, sorry, and uh, that the hammer then travels up again. Uh, but when using the European technique for striking, um, you uh, use a, a tilting movement 
um, uh, added to the rebound. So when, when the hammer hits the anvil, it doesn't travel the same way back up because when you're striking with two or more persons, you can't be in the, in the same plane because then the hammers will hit each other. And then you um, uh, speed up the, uh, the process of going up by tilting the hammer with your other hand, with your, with your in my case, my left hand. And then it follows back to the top and it's like, a, 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 yeah, not really a circular motion, uh, but you have to be out of the way for the other hammer. And then by tilting, you can be very fast. That is what I think. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I do my best to translate this. So uh, Mariano fragte nach Rainiers Meinung, ob die eine oder die andere Techni Technik zum Zuschlagenden besser geeignet ist. Und er sagte, ähm, es hängt davon ab, wofür. Er benutzt meistens, wenn er als Zuschläger arbeitet, mit einem Setzhammer oder einem vergleichbaren Werkzeug die Methode. So you're using this method, which is like with longer strokes, right? Ja. Mhm. Er benutzt die Variante mit dem längeren, mit dem längeren Weg, weil dann die Frequenz besser passt. So because the frequency is better fitting, right? Ja. So. So this, so this is, would be in short. Robin Mood has said, um, you have to, uh, about this farrier discussion, you have to consider that most farriers stand in front of their anvils while forging, what makes quite some sense when forging a horseshoe. Uh, I, I, I translate into German like, every, like in, in bits. I, um, man, man, man muss um, im Kopf behalten, dass Hufschmiede meistens vor ihrem Amboss stehen was während sie schmieden, was für ein, was für ein Hufeisen. Hufeisen auch sehr passend ist. Because most of the, weil, weil die meiste Arbeit ist, das, das, das Werkstück zu biegen, von, ist das Biegen von Flachstahl in die korrekte Form. Und äh, Arbeiten wie... Ähm, ja, mit Setzhammer, Setzhammer Vertiefungen machen und schneiden. So, because most of the shape is bending flat stock into the correct shape and jobs like fullering and clipping. A long handle and the thump up grip we consider as wrong is very comfortable when using a light hammer and having reach inside the horseshoe. Ein leichter Hammer mit den Daumen oben drauf ist sehr, äh, den, den, den wir als falsch ansehen ist sehr komfortabel, wenn man einen leichten Hammer und äh, in, den, in das Hufeisen hineinkommen muss. Would you like to respond to this question, Rainer? Um, if it feels comfortable, it actually doesn't matter because the, the reason why uh, it's a bad habit, because uh, your, your uh, tendon attachment uh, gets a, a, a bad shock to it, um, that's reason enough to stop doing it, although it might feel comfortable. Um, what I learned, let's grab a, What I learned is when you uh, want to have the, the control, you don't place your uh, thumb on top of the handle, but then you can place your index finger on top of the handle because then your wrist makes the natural movement if you want to be very precise with, with small taps or something. Though it might feel comfortable to use it in this way, It's still bad. Übersetzt hat Rainer in etwa sowas gesagt wie, dass, also als Kommentar dazu oder als Antwort darauf, dass es eventuell komfortabel ist, aber es ist, es ist immer noch nicht gut für das Handgelenk und aus, aus diesem, ja, weil eben die Sehnenverbindung da komplett bis nach oben geht, das bleibt alles genauso wahr wie vorher auch. Ähm, er hat, in, also Reini hat gelernt von seinem Lehrer, dass in so einem Fall, wenn man tatsächlich leichte Schläge mit viel Kontro Kontrolle, man zum Beispiel den äh, Zeigefinger oben auf den Stiel, das hat er auch gerade gezeigt, legen kann, um mehr Kontrolle zu erreichen. Robin, möchtest du dazu noch was sagen? Would you like to add something? If so. yeah, I'm uh, personally using a Habermann Hammer, so um, I'm considering this technique as a bad technique uh, also because I'm gripping the hammer like this most of the time but um, I've seen a lot of farriers in my uh, area here because riding horses and 
competitions and horse uh, jumping and stuff like that is pretty traditionally here. And um, the horse shoeing here is uh, done also pretty traditionally, mostly um, without forging the horse shoe uh, while shoeing the horse at the farmer's um, house. They forge it in their home forge and just bring it there. But the shaping is done over there. And if I would use my hammer here and having to use in uh, having to get inside the horseshoe, I would have it to tilt like this. Since the excess length of my hammer is coming out away from me, most of farriers do it like this and it's coming towards them like this. And that's just oh, everything I wanted to add. And I wanted to say that you always have to consider what work you are doing since we blacksmith are sculpting. We like I like working with some clay and working our models and then comes in handy to have a, a lot of access to your body and to all the possibilities you have um, when forging. Uh, you can use a technique like the uh, Ophi technique or like Rainier has shown, but um, yeah, you just have to consider what you're making and what your body has to do. I understand what you mean. And I also agree that the job farriers do and the job as we blacksmiths do is nowadays completely different. But the thing we have in common is that we have the same human body and um, those things still work the same for farriers and uh, blacksmiths. And although everybody should make up their own mind and make their own decisions. Science shows what happens with you uh, when you place your thumb on top. And if I watch uh, a lot of older farriers in my own circle, um, many of them, and especially the farriers who uh, compete or who have competed in their life, um, many, many of them uh, have arm injuries and shoulder injuries and back injuries. I can't draw a line between the two of them, uh, injuries and uh, thumb on top, um, but I can make quite a guess that those two are related. Yeah. Well, very briefly, very briefly, just translate. <laughs> uh, genau. Robin hat dazu gesagt, dass um, man dabei beachten muss, dass die, eben die Arbeit, die Hofschmiede tun, eine etwas andere ist dass da andere, andere Anforderungen sind an das Ergebnis der Arbeit und dementsprechend eventuell eine andere Technik. Also er hat dann auch gezeigt, dass man je nachdem, wie der Hammer, in, sein Hammer zum Beispiel, durch das Handgelenk blockiert würde. Aber das für Hufschmiede unter Umständen gar nicht so der Fall ist. Genau. Und Rainer hat dazu gesagt, dass er das wohl nachvollziehen kann, dass, das, dass die Arbeit auf jeden Fall eine unterschiedliche ist. Aber der menschliche Körper, der dabei ist, ja durchaus ein ähnlicher ist. Und äh, aus seinem Bekanntenkreis viele Hufschmiede, besonders die, die diese Technik mit dem Daumen oben auf dem Hammer benutzt, Hammerstiel benutzen und ähm, die Wettbewerben sich äh, austauschen, also miteinander wetteifern, dass die eben häufig Verletzungen im Armbereich haben. So, beziehungsweise, ja, ja nicht, nicht unbedingt Verletzungen, aber Beschwerden mit dem Handgelenk, Arm und so weiter. Genau. One last comment from uh, Paul Voss. Being a farrier is a very heavy profession because the horses are always unpredictable. This has a result like injuries on legs, feet and back. Um, Paul Voss hat hinzugefügt, dass der Hufschmied auch eine sehr sch schwer lastende Profession ist, weil die Pferde oft unvorhersehbar sind und das führt oft zu Verletzungen in beiden Füßen und im Rücken. Uh, anyway, I would like to go to Victoria's question, who asked if there are any thoughts on the shape of the handle itself. And after translation, I would give this to you, Rainer. Uh, Victoria hat gefragt, ob es irgendwelche Überlegungen zu der Form des Hammergriffs gibt. I think the, the, the form of the handle, the shape of the handle is very important. And it is also very personal. What shape you prefer. Personally, I prefer a, quite a, a thick handle, which is nicely rounded, but like an oval shape with um, quite flat on the sides so I can um, direct the hammer uh, properly. It's not like round 
where it doesn't matter um, in which direction the hammer points, uh, the handle feels the same in every direction. No, that's that's not what I want. I want it to be um, quite round, rounded, but still with two sort of flat sides uh, so I can um, guide the hammer properly. But I really think this is very personal and everybody has their own preferences. Um, I also think, if I can bring it back to the farriers a little bit, <laughs> Um, farriers like very thin long handles um, and I have found that using a thin handle it invites you um, very quickly to put your thumb on top of the handle more uh, than a, a, a more thicker handle then it's not as inviting as with a thin handle. I would like to translate this so uh, the frage was Gibt es irgendwelche Ideen dazu, wie der Hammergriff geformt sein sollte? Und Reinis Antwort dazu war, dass das aus seiner Sicht eine sehr persönliche Sache ist und dass es da viele unterschiedliche Meinungen zu gibt. Seine präferierte Variante ist ein sehr, sehr breites, nee, ein Oval mit sehr, sehr flachen Seiten. Genau, was, was man jetzt auch da sehen kann was dazu führt, dass man einfacher indizieren kann, in welche Richtung, in welcher Orientierung sich der Hammer befindet und den auch einfacher in die gewünschte Orientierung steuern kann. Danach hat er darauf hingewiesen, dass viele Hufschmiede einen äh, langen und dünnen Stiel bevorzugen, was häufig seiner Meinung nach dazu führt, dass man ähm, den Daumen oben auflegt. Und ich würde gerne noch hinzufügen, dass das auch häufig dazu, also bei mir zumindest dazu führt, bei einem sehr, sehr dünnen Stiel, dass ich fester greife was unter Umständen auch nicht so besonders förderlich ist. So, and additionally to what Rainier has said, I would like personally to add that I find with thin hammers often it is such that I tend to grip them tighter, which is also not the most beneficial for the hand. Because uh, ev like uh, ev every part, the hammer handle and uh, the, the hold in here and the wrist, and all the way up, there are puff buffer zones for the shock to travel along. And the less of the shock reaches further, the less damage is done to your body. Like the, I, I, I talked with my physiotherapist about these things and he said, he told that one can imagine it like a bridge over which people go. It's a bit similar with shock. If little child goes over the bridge, it's less impact than if big trucks go over the bridge. And over years and years and years, all the load on the bridge adds up. And it, in the end, the bridge needs to replacement. Obviously, the body is not so easily replaced, <laughs> but it suffers the same damage over time. Yeah. I go to translate this in German. Um, genau. Ich, ich habe mich darüber vor kurzem mit meinem Physiotherapeuten unterhalten und es geht, und er hat gesagt, es, man kann sich das so vorstellen, dass der Schock, der beim Aufprall des Hammerkopfes entsteht, den, durch den Stiel ins Handgelenk und den ganzen Arm entlang läuft. Und je weniger von dem Schock weiterkommt, desto besser ist das. Und wir hatten dann das Beispiel von einer Brücke, wo mal ein kleines Kind drüber geht oder mal ein paar LKWs drüber fahren. Und die Belastung ist natürlich eine andere. Und über Zeit summiert sich diese Belastung auf der Brücke und irgendwann muss die Brücke halt ausgetauscht werden. Mit dem Schock im Verhältnis zum menschlichen Körper ähm, verhält sich das relativ ähnlich, nur dass man den Körper schlechter austauschen kann. Mark Esprit has also has another comment. Let's talk about grip intensity. I like to think of my grasp on the hammer as caressing the handle. I try not to grip with a strong hand. Mark Esperi hat einen weiteren Kommentar. Wenn man über die Intensität des Griffes oder die Festigkeit des Griffs spricht, äh, sanft, also nicht, nicht, nicht besonders, nicht, nicht würgend, sondern eher, eine, ein, ein sanft, ein, eher ein vorsichtiger Griff ist vielleicht ein ganz gutes Wort und äh, nicht mit einem, eben nicht mit nicht den Griff äh, komplett ja. ganz, ganz feste. Ja. Thank you for the comment. My, my teacher, um, he explained it to me uh, that during forging, wanted me to hold the handle very lightly. And he said, when I'm at the top of my swing, I only feel the handle with the tip of my thumb. And when it falls down, I slightly grip it 
and then I hit the workpiece, I release the hammer, handle again, and it's, it's, it's very lightly in my hand. He never did that to me, but his teacher um, uh, sometimes stood by him when he was forging, and he grabbed the hammer on the uh, top part of his swing, and his grip would have to be so light that his hand slid off the handle but still made the same move. Can you understand what I mean? So in German, auf Deutsch. Uh, Reini hat dazu hinzugefügt, dass er von seinem Lehrer gelernt hat, dass der, um, dass der Griff durchgehend so leicht ist, dass der, der, dass der Hammer eben nur geführt wird und dass uh, der Lehrer seines Lehrers bei, bei <lacht> gesagt hat, man muss an der obersten Stelle den, uh, den, den Hammer aus der Hand nehmen können. Und Marc Esprit fügt noch hinzu, dass der, äh, die, die Form des Griffs und die Griffintensität zusammengehören. Ein, äh, ein leichter Griff auf, an einem runden, äh, ein, ein leichtes Zugreifen bei einem runden ähm, Griff kann, ein, kann zu Schwierigkeiten führen. So, uh, but Mark Esprey has added, but hammer handle in shape and shape and grip intensity must go together. A light grip with a round handle can be an issue. And also a crown face will impact this grip as the hammer will travel straighter. Und auch ein um, abgerundeter, eine abgerundete Hammerbahn will den, wird den Griff beeinträchtigen, weil der Hammer um, gerade auf einer geraderen Bahn unterwegs ist. I would like to come to the last question for today, which has been posted by Job van der Zeiden. I hope this is pronounced somewhat correctly enough. So, uh, die letzte Frage für heute Abend ist, welchen Einfluss hat die, der, die, Art, des, die Art des Stahls auf uh, des Hammers, zum Beispiel 45, uh, C45 gegen C60? So, these are different carbon contents, I don't know. And the di und die unter, der Unterschied, des, um, wie der Hammer wieder hochspringt auf die... Technique. Yeah, this is a question I don't have an answer to. Only your question I have an answer to. I, I believe uh, C45 is called 1045 in the United States, uh, as well as C60, that's 1060, I believe. Um, C60 gives a, a harder hammer. But I don't know if there is a difference in rebound. The, the hardness of uh, C45 is more shallow than the hardness of C60. Um, but I have hammers uh, from both steels and I never um, felt any change in rebound whatsoever. But maybe there is, but I can't feel it. Maybe it could be measured. Maybe it's quite small. I, I have absolutely no idea. Wunderbar. There is, uh, Mariano has written also that he would have another thing to add about the hammer handle shape. Mariano hat noch eine Anmerkung zur Form des Hammer Stiels. For, for practice, uh, for a light uh, handle, I, when it's in the top, I twist the hammer and hit with the other side and twist again and twist again. This is a good practice for holding uh, lightly. So you, with the time, you don't try to catch super stronger because uh, you, you are not catching stronger. And with the carbon, for example, this is from my steel. And you really notice the difference between a high carbon steel uh, because this is uh, absorbs more the, the heat and turns to take a little more uh, to go upside again. So this is, for me, the only difference I find. Okay, uh, I, are you alternating with this practice after every blow? Sometimes, uh, one day. Uh, Mariano sagte, dass er, 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 er das, um die Griffintensität zu üben, ganz praktisch fand, mm -hmm. dass man zwischen Finne und zum Beispiel, er hat einen Kugelhammer gezeigt oder einen Ballhammer, wie auch immer der dann auf Deutsch heißt, Balfin Hammer, ähm, dass, der, dass er zwischen Finne und Hammerbahn wechselt nach jedem paar Schlägen oder nach jedem Schlag, je nachdem. 
und das dazu führt, dass der Griff automatisch leicht bleibt, weil man eben ständig wechselt. Und danach hat er noch eine Anmerkung zu dem, ähm, ob, der C, ob sich ein C-Stahl oder ein anderer Stahl auswirkt. Und er sagte, dass... You down the frequency of the hits because it tends to absorb uh, a little more the impact, so deforms the hair feeling. Uh, so, for example, with this handle, maybe I can hit four more time in the same uh, in the same time. Okay. Well, um, genau. Also der, der Unterschied, den er festgestellt hat zwischen einem Hammer, der komplett aus einem C-Stahl ist und einem der nur, also der auch wo der, der Körper aus weicherem Stahl ist, ist, dass die Frequenz dabei eine andere ist. Und zwar ist die Frequenz ähm, von dem äh, gehärtet, also von dem, von dem C-Stahl eine ähm, etwa, etwas schnellere. Weil äh, nach seiner Erfahrung der Schock, also der, 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 der Rückschlag des Ambosses absorbiert wird, besser dadurch. Äh, und es gibt noch zwei weitere Kommentare, die ich gerne noch vorlesen würde. So there are two more comments from the chat, uh, which I would still like to read which are from Charlie Page. I don't have enough experience, but I've heard many times that the hammer has to have a little less hardness than the anvil for not damaging the anvils. So it's mostly used 1040, but I don't know about difference in the rebound. Um, genau. Er sagt, er hat nicht besonders viel Erfahrung damit, aber er hat gehört, dass uh, der Hammer weicher sein sollte als der Amboss, um diesen nicht zu beschädigen. Äh, deshalb nutzt man dafür meistens 1040, was auch immer das in der europäischen Version ist. C40. Okay, this, this, okay C40. <laughs> Danke. Thank you. And uh, Anne Fleek said, I'd say the hardness of the hammer makes hardly any difference since your workpiece is, not, is hot softer than the hammer. Uh, Anna Fleek sagt dazu, dass die Härte des Hammers wahrscheinlich relativ einen kleinen Einfluss hat, weil das Werkstück warm sowieso weicher ist als der Hammer. The next, uh, thank you, Rainier, for holding this treff the second time. The future treffs are in planning. The next one is confirmed in the 19th of April and will be held by Manix Callier from Belgium who uh, will talk about, he, he, he has background in manufacture, like, like uh, computer assisted manufacturing. And he will talk about how to bring it from the two, like from the CAD program into the forged reality piece in whichever order he will then talk about it. That's what he told me. So in German. Um, yeah, vielen Dank für den heutigen Treff rein hier. Und die nächsten folgenden Termine sind teilweise auch schon geplant. Es wird am 19.04. von Manix Callier aus Belgien, auch bekannt als Mechanix, eine Präsentation dazu geben. Der hat einen Hintergrund in computerassistierter, ja, computerassistierten Arbeiten mit Stahl. Und da wird eine Präsentation dazu halten, wie man vom, von der CAD-Zeichnung bis zum fertig geschmiedeten Werkstück in einer Reihenfolge, die er passend findet. Das hat er mir zumindest so gesagt. Yes. Next Treff will be uh, again on a Monday at the same time, uh, 19, but by then it is CEST, because we will switch to summertime like over next week or something. This can be found on the website. I don't know how this affects other people in the world. I know some change the time zone, like the time for summertime, some don't. I don't know how this affects everyone individually. Um, der nächste Treff wird auch wieder um 19 Uhr sein, dann allerdings CEST, also Sommerzeit. Um, wie auch immer das dann die einzelnen Teilnehmer effect, uh, betrifft. Genau, ja. Yeah. So, and now that so many people are present, I would like to say again, thank you for the people who have started to become the Jungschmiede team. Thanks to Robin Muth, Rainer Hoving, Paul Voss, Emil Geis, and Mariano Garabato for volunteering to support this Jungschmiede um, 
website and the activity and the YouTube channel, which I have been doing so far alone. And they have said, we would like to help in this process. Thank you to everyone. Um, ich würde jetzt, da wir jetzt inzwischen mehr sind, auch gerne noch mal auf Deutsch, dem Jungschmiedeteam, was sich jetzt letztlich äh, geformt hat, danken, namentlich ähm, Rainer Hofing, Robin Moth, Paul Voss, Mariano Garabato und Emil Geis. Dafür, äh, die, bisher hatte ich die Sachen hauptsächlich alleine gemacht und äh, die haben sich bereit erklärt, das zu unterstützen, sprich die YouTube-Seite und den, äh, die Webseite und das Ganze drumherum.